All right, welcome to our Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Tonight we have Neil Shera. Neil is a connoisseur and a curator of baseball, and he did a wonderful uh, creation at the uh, Morris Jamel Mansion a few years ago. And he's going to share that with us tonight via uh, uh, YouTube video. Uh, but before we start that, just a couple of uh, news items. We will get back together in a couple of weeks. The next meeting is scheduled for July 14th. Uh, in the interim, if I am able to procure somebody from San Francisco to talk about uh, the, basically the halfway mark of the season, I will make an attempt to do that. Uh, I left the meetings a little staggered for the summertime because a lot of people tend to go away. As you can see, we don't have a huge crowd like we normally do. And Neil, that's absolutely no reflection on you. So um, I'm sure people will be coming in also. Um, so we'll have uh, uh, Dan Taylor in two weeks. He's going to be talking about Kenny Washington, the football equivalent to Jackie Robinson and Kenny Washington also had something to do with the New York Giants, which Dan will be uh, discussing with us. And then the following Wednesday, which would be, I think, July 20th, uh, we're going to have an author, uh, Paul Kosak, discussing a book he wrote about Willie Mays that I think you'll find very, very interesting. So what's going to happen is Neil's going to talk a little, maybe a couple of minutes, just tell, tell him, telling you guys about uh, his ventures and going, going, gone sports. Uh, then he'll give me the cue and I will uh, take his YouTube tape and we'll watch it for about 30 minutes. The tape is about 44 minutes. I will also send that, you know, when we do a recap so you could watch the other thing, everything in its pertinent, but the 30 minutes that I chose have to do with the baseball giants, the football giants, uh, uh, boxing, and uh, very famous college events, all having to do with the polo grounds. Neil also did a, a something on the Yankees, which, you know, if you're a Yankee fan, it's great, but um, to conserve time, I, I cut it to 30 minutes, as per Neil as well. And after that's done, uh, we will, Neil will take questions. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to present Neil Shera. Neil, thank you so much for coming aboard. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me be part of your group's uh, meeting tonight. Um, uh, I've been basically, like many of you, I grew up as a sports fan just north of the city in a town called Mount Vernon, which plays a certain part, a certain historic moment at the Polo Grounds with Ralph Branca, of course, being a Mount Vernon kid. Um, and um, I've also been a, uh, involved in the art world for quite a bit. So what I did about eight or nine years ago, I joined my two passions, sports and art, uh, in a way creating unique, one-of-a-kind displays, celebrating uh, individuals, great teams, special moments in sports history. And this idea seemed to blossom from a four-floor walk-up to eventually uh, some of the finer galleries in New York City, and then I've been asked over the last few years to curate museum shows around the country. I did one on the Yankee Red Sox rivalry in Connecticut. And I was asked a few years ago by the Marshall Mill Museum to do one uh, celebrating the polo grounds, uh, being that that was right across the street from the Marshall uh, Mill Museum. And so this, this ride has been pretty exciting. And uh, um, I think you'll see that we, our pieces are pretty unique. They take sometimes two to three years to complete. But at the end, I think it tells a great story. Uh, my idea is that the, a single autograph, a single program, uh, a single photograph are great, but when you join many items together, it tells a story and in essence, it becomes a piece of art. So I hope you enjoy the video and then I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Sounds great. I have seen this, it's, it's marvelous. So, and again, besides sending this out tomorrow, I will include Neil's entire um, YouTube video. All right, so let's make sure I can do this right. And let's see, here it is. All right, I think I got it. Say who? Swinging at the plate, say hey who? 
Say really, that giant kid is great. When he hits the phone, it's long gone, man. It's more than can begin. Hello, I'm Neil Shearer, and we're here now at the Morris Jamel Museum, the historic building in Upper Manhattan. Uh, I am an attorney, art dealer, and sports enthusiast. And for the last number of years, I've joined my two passions, sports and art, to create unique uh, uh, displays and tributes celebrating individual team and special moments in sports. It's been exciting to see our idea basically move from a 4 4 walk up to the finer stores on Madison Avenue and now featured in museums. Um, the the, the Marsh Jamel Museum contacted me a little bit more than a year ago and gave me seven months to put together a show dealing with the polo grounds. And which of course, when I first heard about it, I had no idea what the Marsh Jamel Museum was. Uh, doing some research, it really intrigued me in the fact that it's uh, a museum, uh, currently a museum, but it's the oldest home in Manhattan. Uh, built in, 19, in, in 1765 by the Morris family. Um, and of course, some of our revolutionary icons, Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson, uh, all spent time here. It was in fact, George Washington's headquarters. But um, what I, I, normally what I say about the Morris family who were, who were, who were, who were loyalists, I say normally I, I'm not a big fan of loyalists or traitors. However, you have to give the Morris family some credit in the fact that they built a home that 120 years later would have great sight lines of America's most iconic stadium, in my judgment, the Polo Grounds. So, uh, so many things happened at the Polo Grounds that I didn't realize when I first started studying it. We knew about the New York Giants baseball team, but I even wasn't too sure about the New York Giants football team. I should have known that, but now I know for sure. The New York Mets, New York Jets, I did know about that, of course. The Yankees are interesting. They don't become the Yankees until 1913, their first year at the Polo Grounds. Before that, they were the Highlands. We're not, about, not up in the Highlands anymore. They're in Coogan's uh, Hollow. So, of course, they have to change their name, or at least they thought they did. Um, so, anyway, uh, we're going to talk a lot about what happened at the Polo Grounds. I took the challenge. I wish I had a little bit more time, but I think uh, you're going to enjoy the show. And what we'd like to start off with being at Coogan's uh, Block is the miracle of Coogan's Block. And this happens in 1951 when New York Giants play the Brooklyn Dodgers in a three-game playoff. It wasn't a one-game playoff. Later on, we talked about Fred Bonehead Merkel, but I would argue that the Bonehead may be Charlie Dresden of the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. He wins a coin flip and basically defers the last two games. Nobody ever does it, although this year you can make a little bit of an exception because of the fact that it was a home, the World Series home field disadvantage series with no home team winning it. In any event, in game three, Bobby Thompson hits a dramatic home run over Mount Vernon's Ralph Branca, and Russ Hodges screams, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. Well, what you see here is we actually have inside the, the sleeve the record of Russ Hodges making that famous call. <laughs> Leo the Roadster and original wire photos can't stop loving Bobby Thompson, and the fans adore and serenade him through the night. You can see them all sit, stay, at the polo grounds. Being at the, the center field locker room was in, in dead center field. Um, it was a little bit interesting. So the fans were basically serenading him, waving, uh, waving at them at, at this high position. It must have been some sight for Mr. Thompson to watch that. Um, here's a rare ticket stub and the program signed by the two players. What's really interesting was the fact that people were expecting the Dodgers to win and not the Giants. So much so that we had a program made, the Dodgers play the Yankees, and of course the Giants would play the Yankees. So um, it's sort of our Dewey defeats Truman type of piece. And as we, as we try to have a little fun, the way it should be and the way it was. Now, um, what, what's also sort of fascinating and timely in a, in a, in a strange sense is today the mage story the last week or so has been the signal uh, stealing scandal of the Houston Astros. 
my feeling is the Major League Baseball come down hard on the Giants. Uh, now, it doesn't really come to light for 2000, but it's accepted by 2005 that they cheated. Then maybe that Houston Astro scandal never happened because the punishment penalty would be known and be so severe. Uh, of course, I, I, what could they have done? I don't know, maybe put at least, a, at least an asterisk next to the name, giving, um, you know, giving poor Ralph Franca, my Ralph Franca from Mount Vernon, uh, a little bit more, of, uh, you know, uh, justice in this world. He doesn't have that. But what they did was very elaborate. If, if the, the, the reportings are correct. Remember, as I said with Bobby Thompson, the locker room was in center field. So they were able to put a telescope there, hide it, were able to see the signals, and by some elaborate means, they had a wire or something that would go into the locker room, uh, into, the, into the dugout, uh, bullpen, sorry, the bullpen, which was in the field. Uh, one buzz would mean a fastball, two buzzes would be a curveball or, a, uh, 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 or, or an off-speed pitch. Sally Barr is based on how he handled the towel, apparently, would give that indication to the batter, and Bobby Thompson knows what's coming, and he hits that home run and changed the baseball history. So it's funny, history repeats itself, and we saw that just this week. So anyway, the rest of our show, we're going to talk about great moments at the Polo Grounds, uh, interesting moments at the Polo Grounds, some that, again, uh, speak of what's going on today with safety issues, with people's uh, uh, passing, such as uh, uh, Don uh, Larson and people like that. So anyway, come join me for the rest of the show here at the Morris Chanel Museum. Polo grounds sounds a little odd. Why are they called the polo grounds? Well, the first polo grounds, they're actually played polo. That was on 110th and 112th Street. And New York, it was actually the New York Gothams at the time and the New York Metropolitans played there in the 1880s. It wasn't until the 1890s, 1891 area, that they came up here to 155th, 157th Street, where they would, where the, would stay a stadium until 1964. Uh, and it was quite a stadium. As we go through, we'll be talking about college football, boxing, uh, the great baseball games, uh, the, 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 the great football games. And um, it's, quite a, it's quite a stadium. I wish, I wish I could have gotten to a game there. But I think with the show, as we go through, we're going to bring you into that wonderful stadium. Now, if we're going to talk about perfect games, no hitters, we've got to talk about Sandy Koufax. And what is uh, the great Sandy Koufax threw four no hitters in his very short career. He retired before he was 30. Uh, at the time he retired, he had the record. It's been seen, since then passed by Nolan Ryan. But our piece here celebrates and commemorates that, that, those four no hitters. His first no hitter occurred in 1962 against the lowly Mets who played at of the polo grounds. Mel Steiner's the umpire. And Felix Montilla makes the final out. Incidentally, in his first no hitter uh, of his four, um, the first hitting was an immaculate hitting win. Nine pitches, three outs. Um, his second no hitter was against a much more challenging against Juan Marichal of the San Francisco Giants, who had left the polo grounds years earlier at, when they were the New York Giants. And Frank Walsh is the umpire. You can see we have his autograph open for baseball. And Harvey Keene makes the final out. His third no-hitter was in Philadelphia in 1964, and Ed Bargo was the umpire. And while Bobby Wine is um, uh, making the final out, he foul tips the ball into Ed Bargo's uh, throat area. There's apples at him. He's in tremendous pain, but he refuses to leave the game. He didn't want to hurt the rhythm of Sandy Koufax. And when you think about it, pitchers make great rhythm. If you have to change the umpire, with all the equipment change, it might be 20 minutes, and who knows how Colfax is going to fare after that. So after the game, I thought it was interesting, the original Sporting News articles here, um, Mr. Colfax writes on a baseball, thanks for a great game, Sandy Colfax to the umpire. I thought that was interesting. Now, speaking of real gems, he said his fourth no-hitter is his real gem, the perfect game. And he did that against the Chicago Cubs on September 9th, 1965. And... The other pitcher, Bob Henley of the Cubs, was also magnificent. He threw a one-hitter. So you get a perfect game and a one-hitter. Can't get much better than that. Many people think it's the greatest game ever pitched. Believe it or not, Ed Bar goes the umpire, and Harvey Keene makes the final out. And there, again, is a handsome, young uh, Sandy Koufax celebrating his four no-hitters holding four balls in his hand. Uh, fun, kind of an interesting story. 
Sidney Kopex is generally regarded as the greatest Jewish baseball player, certainly pitcher. And in 1965, on game one against the Minnesota Twins in the World Series, it was young kid four, and he decided he could not play on that day. Uh, Don Drysdale, a great pitcher in his own right, um, takes over, and uncharacteristically, uh, Drysdale gets bombed. He gets up seven runs or so in three innings. So when Walter Alston, the manager, comes out to get the ball from him, uh, on Charles Hills, he drops the ball to the umpire and so Walter Austin's hand says, bet you wish I was Jewish too. In any event, uh, that is uh, the great Sandy Kovac. Well, as bad as the Mets were in 62, as we saw in the Kovac piece, they win in 69 and 86. And here's how he's paying homage to the 86 Mets. We have all seven tickets when he beat the Red Sox. Part of a chair that you would have gotten at the back of a chair that we got at Shea Stadium. The famous moment when 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 Bill Buckner lost the ball between his legs on Mookie Wilson's hit. Uh, poor Mr. Buckner passed away recently. Um, here is, by the way, the autograph of all the Met players in the scrum. And as I look at this, you know, being that these players were millions and millions of dollars, I, I can't help to think that probably the agent of the losing team's players is probably more of a lead than the winning team's players. Uh, you just hope nobody gets hurt in these big scrums here. Now, um, the piece also has pennant winning tickets and uh, the first game of the season tickets. So it's really a great piece uh, showing that 86 team. But people don't, some people don't realize that the Mets and the Jets both began at the Polo Ground. So we show that here, this little area here. In fact, the Jets were called the Titans their first two years Sammy Ball was our head coach. Here's a, a piece of one of my favorite teams, the 69 Mets, signed by all the players. Another interesting aspect was going to a Jets game in the 1960s, you could basically get what they call is a New York City Transit Authority discount ticket. Uh, you could pick that up at the subway station and you could bring it to the game and get a discount. You paid like $2 to go to a Titans football game um, uh, in 1960. In fact, this ticket was for the uh, Thanksgiving Day, get a game that was going to be played in uh, November 24th, 1960. That's pretty interesting. Uh, here is what I call one of my most, most fascinating individual items. Again, we like to do more elaborate pieces, but occasionally when you don't have time, also when it's just too good to pass out, you still got to recognize it. On December 7th, 1941, America's attacked at Pearl Harbor. There are 55,000 fans of the Polo Grounds. Hi, I, I, I'm on a Zoom with my baseball team. Dodger football team led by Ace. No? no one would know that they are, that we are war until they come home that day. Interestingly enough, at my show here, at our show here, we've had a number of people who've come here who are at the bottom of the Super Bowl run, who are at Willie Mays' catch. Not many, no, maybe one guy we had to carry up into the... Uh, into the second floor, and, and it was one of my, my favorite moments of the whole show. He tells us, and it's also been reported, that at halftime, he recollects that he heard an income, Regiment 37 or something like that, please report to headquarters. So there were hints that something was going on, but nobody knew that we were attacked uh, at Pearl Harbor. How could you? The thing that I like to bring up is how technology has changed. It's been, it's been pretty obvious, it's been a long time, so of course it has. But, if that happens today, obviously, or even a few years earlier, um, the whole stadium would know about it within minutes and very likely. That could have been That's a lot to do with it. You can have that if you want. Go ahead, fine. Listen, Thank you. excuse me, I'm sorry. What the hell's going on here? I can't see everybody because I'm doing the yeah, work. need to shut off. Please. Mute. Thank you. I'm sorry, Neil. Of course, we talked about technology and how it affected the uh, the um, Bobby Thompson home run with the, the, the cheating scandal, and currently with 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 uh, the Houston Astros. So again, technology is kind of an interesting facet when we talk about sports. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. One of the challenges for us was to put this. Uh, this uh, exhibit together in less than seven months, basically. As you know, looking at our first piece, we love to do special tributes and displays. But with such a little bit of time, I knew I had to add some things 
um, that are just special and need to be in any great baseball show. And one of those things, of course, is you have to mention the great Jackie Robinson and his importance to baseball. And he breaks the color barrier in 1947 at Ebbets Field. And later, right here at the polo grounds, he hits his first home run. Monty Irvin and Hank Thompson uh, break the color barrier in 1949 for the New York Giants. Um, Hank Thompson's actually a very interesting player in the fact that he broke the cover barrier for the St. Louis Browns two years later. Of course, the Browns later become the Baltimore Orioles. Mr. Thompson is the only player to break the cover barrier for two different teams. Also, Mr. Thompson's interesting. He played in the first World Black Outfield with Monty Irvin and the great Willie Mays. He also was the first black player to play at Yankee Stadium as he was playing for the St. Louis Browns with the American League. Now, if you're going to talk about the polo grounds, you always talk about Bobby Thompson home run, considered one of the greatest home runs of all time. But you also have to talk about the catch that Willie Mays caught in 1954 on a long ball by, the, by Dick Wirtz. Uh, the polo grounds was a unique shaped stadium. Also Guys, dinner time. And down the lines were ridiculously short, 257 and 289, I believe. But dead center was a, was a monster, about 483. Um, only four ball players ever hit a home run out the dead center, including Luke Easter of the Negro Leagues, the great Hank Aaron, um, Joe Adcock, and also. Hey, uh, Shrimpy, where are you? He brought. So hey, Shrimpy. Ball, it would have been a home run in any other ballpark. Perhaps it changes the whole series itself. But um, that was uh, one of the catches that made Willie Mays famous. What's also extraordinary or really was a lot of fun to me during the time I did the show is we had people visit our show who were at the catch, who were at the Bobby Thompson home run. And to hear their stories and experiences, you, you could feel their excitement even today. It's been 50, 60 years, 70 years later. So it's been exciting to, to hear their stories. Now, this ticket that you see here is from 1951 World Series. And all of the Yankees won the World Series it's one of the few times where the championship team is sort of overshadowed by the Bobby Thompson home run. Everybody talks about the Bobby Thompson home run. Also, probably the Yankees winning 27 World Series. They can probably forget one or two here and there. Now we come to the New York football giants. We spent time with the New York baseball giants. Let's go to the New York football giants. People don't realize New York football giants played at the Polo Grounds from 1925 to 1955. And, one, and in 1938, they won one of their championships. And I was lucky enough to secure a sheet of all the players who played on the 1938 team. If I'm a memorabilia guy, strictly, I flip it and make my money. But of course, our job is to tell these great stories. And to do that, we need to incorporate many pieces. So we couldn't get rid of that piece. Um, what I like to show people, though, we have all the programs. And what's interesting about the programs is you notice they play teams called the Pittsburgh Pirates and Brooklyn Dodgers, which were usually affiliated with baseball. Uh, the reason why they did it, as popular as football is today as we head toward another Super Bowl, is the fact that football was a fledgling league in the 30s and 40s. And what they do is sort of piggyback over the more successful baseball teams in order to get fan recognition and a better game. Incidentally, this is a young, I think handsome, Willie Tamara, I was surprised he's 22 years in this piece. Of course, his father, Tim Mara, plays New York Giants in 1925. What did they pay for the New York Giants? The unconscionable sum of $500. Uh, from what I know now, it's worth about $3 billion. And also, although they've given half their share to the Titch family, I think they're doing pretty well. Another thing that we put in here, of course, we have the championship program and, and, the, and ticket, which are pretty rare. And of course, Coach Steve Owen. Among the players who played on that team was Ward Cup, Mel Hine, Tuffy Lehman from Fordham. We'll talk about Fordham in a little bit. And um, Hank Soar, who plays a part in my life a little bit. Um, now, here, now Hank Soar scored the winning touchdown, by the way. So remember the name Hank Soar. Um, now, here is um, uh, the roster. And why I show that roster is being a University of Wisconsin guy and still recovering from the Rose Bowl defeat. Um, Generally, uh, linemen, players, 280, 300, 320, 340. Certainly pro football players are. Back in 1938, if you were 210 or 205, you were a big guy. I love this name. Tarzan White from the University of Alabama played guard at 5'9". 
maybe I'll too be a big card uh, back then. So I found that really interesting. Another thing about it I want to bring up is that generally in pro football, most people think the most important game is a 58 giant cold game. I agree. Other people will say the most, second most is Super Bowl three between the Colts and the Jets. I think that's very important, especially with the leagues merging. But the third most important football game, in my estimation, was played in 1930 between the New York Giant football team and the Notre Dame All-Star team. And why that was, it was the 1930s. Jimmy Walker, the mayor of New York, wanted to have a charity event to try to raise money for, the, for the, some of the poor. Uh, and, and, and what he did was he asked the Giants if they would get involved. The Giants said yes, but they had trouble getting a pro football team. So they looked around. They got Notre Dame, shockingly. And at that time, pro football and college football were fairly considered uh, on the same playing field. In fact, some people thought college football was the better game. Well, Newt Rockney came into town, and the Giants won very easily. And after that game, pro football was always considered the superior sport. Also, sadly to say, that would be the last game Newt Rockney, the great Newt Rockney would coach. Two months later, he would die, sadly, in a plane accident. But let's get to college football now. We don't really have great college football these days, but that wasn't the case in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and even earlier. Columbia was a good football team. NYU had a football team, and Fordham certainly had a good football team. Uh, Vince Lombardi's guys. In fact, the Cleveland Rams in 1936, when they come to the league, picked the name Rams from because Fordham was such a good team. That's why they picked the name Rams. I was a little surprised when I heard that. So what we try to do, and also you can get 30,000, 40,000 fans here. So what we try to do is, at our show, is show you some of the great college football that was played here. Imagine Ohio State and Alabama coming into the polo grounds to play Fordham, West Virginia, Army Duke. Army Navy played nine times at the polo grounds. Harvard Yale, when it was a really important game, uh, the game was played on Thanksgiving a number of times at the polo grounds. So we wanted people to know that um, at one time Saturdays, you could have good football in New York. Uh, it's just been a long time. Maybe one of those teams could come back and, and bring a football team back. But anyway, this is uh, just giving you a little idea about college football in New York in the 30s and 40s. All right, let's move a little up. series home runs. <laughs> well, we've talked about baseball. We've talked about football. Why not talk about possibly the most important sport of the turn of the century, and that was boxing. Some of the greatest boxing matches of all time occurred right here at the Polo Grounds. Um, being an art dealer, I've always uh, appreciated George Bellows, one of my favorite artists. Mr. Bellows was at the first fight we're going to be talking about. as actually a photographer, and his, one of his famous paintings, uh, Dempsey Furpo, I believe is at the Whitney Museum. And it occurs in 1921, and Louis Furpo is the fighter uh, from Argentina, and there are nine knockdowns in two rounds. It's a very brutal fight. I saw it on YouTube. I couldn't believe it. Unlike today, we have a 10 count. You have to go to the opposite corner. Back then, he just hovered over the guy, gets up, and start whacking him again. So there were nine knockdowns in two rounds. Dempsey is actually the guy who goes outside the ring, but he's pushed back in by the hands, and he ends up winning the fight. Louis Furpo, although he loses the fight, becomes a national hero in Argentina, and he's celebrated throughout his life, even though he loses the fight to um, uh, Mr. Dempsey. It's the first time I think a Latin American fighter fights in the heavyweight championship. Now we go to the great Joe Lewis, and although he's a Detroit kid, he's now basically living across the street from the Morris Jumel Museum, where Joe Lewis goes to fight Billy Kahn. When he goes to the fight, they probably walks to the, to the polo grounds. So what happens in the Billy Kahn? Uh, Joe Lewis fight that took place in 41. Well, what happens is Billy Kahn, the big underdog, is just too fast for Lewis, and he's basically uh, frustrating Lewis, and he's winning on all scorecards. If he just stays away the final three rounds, he will be the heavyweight champion, one of the great upsets in, in heavyweight history. Well, what happens is he gets a little bit cocky, he tries to go for the victory, and he makes some comment about uh, how it being Irish, he has a right to do something crazy like that. I don't understand it, but he 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 ends up losing that fight by being knocked out by Joe Lewis, and that was the end of Mr. Khan's uh, uh, comeback or, or, or upset victory uh, 
opportunity. Also, the last fight that I'm going to talk about here is Floyd Patterson fighting Ingemar Johansson in 1960. Uh, the year earlier, Johansson had defeated uh, Floyd Patterson in a, uh, a fight at Yankee Stadium. So when Patterson defeats Ingemar Johansson, he becomes the first heavyweight to regain his heavyweight championship. Perhaps a Yeah. So as we come to the end of the show, um, I, I did what we could in that, that period of time, but I would have probably liked a little more time to do more complete pieces of some people I think really uh, deserve special attention. So, but we did, we're able to at least give them some attention with photographs and some tickets. For example, Eddie Grant here, Harvard Eddie, would say, I have it instead of I got it because, you know, he went to Harvard, you got to say, speak English correctly. Poor Eddie Grant, though, was the first ball player to die in World War I. And the Giants, one of the teams he played for, in his honor, had a monument for him. And um, unfortunately, when the Polo Grounds was knocked down in 1964, nobody knows really where the monument went. Carl Hubble, of course, was a great pitcher for the New York Giants and, of course, is known for the World for the All-Star game where he struck out five great players in a row, including... Uh, Ruth, Derek, Fox, Simmons, I believe, <laughs> get the last one, but uh, he, he, he had quite quite an all-star game that, that day, and also was a great pitcher for the New York Giants. Chrissy Math and Big Six, uh, I believe, came to the Morris Jamel Museum. He was an intellectual, Bucknell graduate, chess and checkers champion. Uh, one of the frustrations I have here a little bit is finding who actually came here. Um, uh, athletes, uh, being, being that the, all these sports teams play a block away. So I, I'm pretty much convinced that he must have come here. Sadly for Mr. Matthews, and he had somewhat of a similar fate to Eddie Grant in the sense that uh, he got hit by a mustard gas, you know, sort of a friendly fire type of incident. He's never the same, and he dies young at the age of 45. Um, interestingly enough, the reports are accurate that Ty Cobb was right next to him when the mustard gas went off. Never affected Ty Cobb. <laughs> you know, still it's amazing. Uh, John McGraw, I think one of the greatest managers of all time. Managed the Giants for many, many years. Believed in the scientific approach of baseball. He thought that Babe Ruth actually destroyed the game of baseball because he didn't believe in the home run. Um, he actually kicks out the, the, one of the reasons the Yankees left the polo grounds was because he, he didn't want them there. They were beginning to get embarrassed. The Yankees' attendance was getting better than his New York Giants. I'm just still will never understand why he was able to, the Yankees were basically able to move basically across the street. Uh, but in any event, he, he kicks them out. Uh, some other things here, notables. Uh, of course, uh, Mel Ott, one of the great baseball home run hitters, uh, one of the greatest New York Giants. Um, uh, Fred Bonehead Merkel, Total pandemonium in 1908, uh, 19 year old kid, uh, really, I think, got short strip uh, and, and probably does not deserve that title. Uh, he plays in, his, uh, in, one of, uh, in a late season game against the Cubs. He gets a hit to move Moose McCormick in the bottom of the ninth of the time game to third base. Al Brigwell then uh, hit, gets a single to uh, win the game, basically, or so everybody thought. Pandemonium comes to the field. All the people start to go into the field celebrating. Turns out Frank Chance had a different view and thought that um, Mr. Merkel never touched second base and argues with umpire Hank O'Day. And then John McGraw starts arguing. Christine Atkinson gets about. Supposedly John McGinley may have gotten the ball thrown in, in, into the stands. Anyway, it's crazy. The only thing that I could think of in my uh, life that comes close to it and, and pales in comparison to fighting George Brett situation. Of course, this is actually an important baseball game. Uh, that was just Brett, you know, uh, going nuts after the the, um, the, the pine tar incident. Uh, also, Roger Connor. Roger Connor is Babe Ruth before Babe Ruth. Hits 138 home runs in the dead ball era. Um, uh, that lasts for 23 or so years. Uh, then a guy named Babe Ruth comes and just decimates it, and that's the end of Roger Connor. Well, but interestingly enough, if you look at early papers, uh, when they call the Gothams, and of course that's what they were when he first started with, with the Giants, um, he's often referred to as a Giant. The Giant came up, the Giant got a hit, the Giant led the team. 
you almost get the sense that they become the Giants somewhat because of Roger Connor, although I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, another thing I want to make special attention to, and um, we don't have it here, but we, we had it in the show, is the incident that changed baseball in some ways. Um, sad story of Carl Mays killing Ray Chapman with a pitch, the only baseball player killed that occurred uh, in um, 1919. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, reading what, what I've read, Ray Chapman was almost a Gina Rest type of figure, not, not quality player, but person so big loved. And when he's killed, the whole town of Cleveland comes out to see him. And Carl Mays is not very much like even his own teammates had some issues with him. Um, and he um, always thought that he didn't make the, the, the Hall of Fame because of him killing Ray Chapman, which a lot of people thought he could have shown more, uh, you know, remorse about. Um, anyway, it's, it's a sad chapter, but Branch Rickey and a few other people after that get involved with safety, which is another concept. Again, history repeats itself. And um, uh, eventually the batting helmet does develop. Actually, much later than I would have thought, because this happens, you know, around 1919, but it doesn't really become a thing mandatory until I think even the early 60s, if I'm correct. Um, so uh, anyway, that's kind of a lot of, of my show with the Polo Grounds. The one thing I will say between the Polo Grounds and the Marshmallow Museum, uh, you know, we got, we got Washington, we got Hamilton, we got Jefferson, we got Ruth, we got Garrick, we got Ott. Now that's a lineup. And I think everybody should come to this museum uh, to see a lineup that you're not going to see anywhere else. Thank you. And uh, let's, uh, let's all wish we could have seen the polo grounds. Hopefully, hopefully we brought it to life here today. We need a hit, so here I go. Neil, that was uh, fabulous. Let's give it up to Neil. Neil, I got to say, first of all, I want to apologize that I had to stop the, the video. Um, I, you know, we can't have people coming in and not, not muting, and I didn't want your show to be ruined. So uh, I've asked this many a time. Please, when you come in, mute, because it's very disruptive, and it's, it's not a good look. Uh, I got to say, Neil, Unfortunately, I was not able to get there, but I feel like I was there after today. I hope you think I did a good job uh, fast forwarding. The only thing really left out was the Yankees, and none of us here like okay with me, that. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay with me. <laughs> but I, I think uh, everybody saw that the. Uh, I know Hindi was loving the Mets thing that uh, the Polo Ground served more than the New York Giants, that it really had many, many historic events that occurred and that museum is 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 so close to where the polo grounds you know is today and it, it, it's been there forever so uh we are opened up for uh, any kind of questions uh feel free to raise your hand and i will choose you steve go ahead i i was off a little bit because i had a phone call i wanted to know that did soccer come into this? Because I remember being there for a soccer game there were some soccer there were some soccer matches there I think they happened later, though. I, I think they happened in the 
40s and even the 50s. There's also Gaelic football that was played there. Yeah, and I, football. I remember, I remember yeah. soccer, and I, I was a camper in 1959. I remember they took us to see, I think it was the New York Americans versus Everton of England a soccer game, <laughs> a weekday night. I mean, there was no Giants, there was no Mets, you know, it was in between. But this is a great, uh, great exhibit. Wow. Thank you. I, you know, I hadn't looked at it in a while and uh, I was a little nervous to see what I did, but I, I, it was a lot of work, but it was enjoyable too. And to learn so much is what, one of the things I love to do and to bring back history. Um, there were a lot of young people who came there and it gets me, maybe it's just that I'm getting older, whatever, but it's disappointing when some young people don't know who Uli Mays is or, or who Hank Aaron is or who Roberto Clemente is. And so I like to think that I'm doing something to bring back history for the younger people. Very much so. Uh, Harvey, go ahead. You know, that was wonderful. I really wish I knew it was, uh, that exhibit was available, although I, for other reasons, I probably wouldn't have been able to attend that. That is, it's magnificent. And uh, you are to be applauded for that. Uh, I am constrained to uh, make a comment about the section about Bobby Thompson's Okay. Uh, home run. Louder. Say again. She can't hear you. Louder. You're not talking loud enough. I'm not talking loud enough. <laughs> really? Me? <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'm actually yelling, but um, I, I had the great fortune of meeting Bobby uh, many times. And uh, we specifically discussed uh, in the wake of the Wall Street Journal articles uh, that appeared about the so-called sign stealing. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but Bobby raised the issue with me and said he didn't take the sign. He knew they were stealing signs, and he did not have faith in Sal Evars, uh, who was relaying the signs from the right field bullpen, and he feared that if, if he was getting a signal for a curveball, he leaned in and it was a fastball. He'd get one right in the head. Uh, the other argument about that is Whitey Lockman was on second base. There was no reason for the Giants to use the, the uh, uh, spyglass in center field. Whitey was 90 feet from or whatever it is. I'm, I'm not good at math. He was at the other end of the square and uh, he could relay the signs. Um, so I just, I just feel constrained to say that. Other than that, <laughs> it was a great presentation really yeah, I, and i appreciate your thoughts and you know i thought about that myself um because there was some uh talk about that and but it seemed like later i don't know what years you spoke with mr thompson but it seemed like later uh toward the end he came around to agreeing a little bit that he at least he knew of the sign it sounded like that to me but it, it, well, the other thing i'll bring up is even if you discount that particular game um this apparently took place sometime in August, uh, late August, I believe, when they did this. They were down by about 11 games or August, so. August 11th, they were down 13 and a half 13 games. 13 and a half games, yes. Yeah, like, and that's when I guess Leo DeRocha figured, hey, let's figure something out here. And about that time is when he went to this whole uh, situation. I believe there was a guy who played for the Cubs who was traded to them. I forgot his name. Henry, done Henry the Shens. Henry Shens. That's right, Henry Shens. And he had notified DeRosha that he had done this, I think, with the Cubs. And DeRosha, you know, said, hey, this sounds pretty good. <laughs> we have nothing to lose, I guess. And he, had, and he did this elaborate setup. Um, and uh, my point was, as you could tell, when I did this show, it was about two years ago. It happened around the time of the, um, the Houston scandal uh, against the Yankees and, and the World Series. So I thought it was interesting to bring it up. I actually give the Giants more credit. I, they're... they're you would have thought, thought that their approach would have been the later one and the Houston approach would have been the earlier one because it's much more sophisticated than the New York Giants did it in many ways. I first, just, just to finish the point, I first met Bobby around 1995, but yeah. the, the, the times I had dinner with him, as a matter of fact, the last time I met with him, Gary was with me. We went to that... Uh, Staten Island Hall of Fame. Staten Island uh, uh, Hall of Fame dinner, which was what, Gary, about 2005? Yeah, something like that. Uh, and and uh, so I, and the conversation I had with him about the sign stealing was, I know for certain, was 2002. It was right after the article came out in the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
but anyway, that's that's no, but it's a good. But the other thing I bring out though, in, in to give great respect to uh Bobby Thompson and Ralph Franco, was I talk about how uh, misfortunes in sports and as in life, how people handle them. And uh, if you remember a number of years ago, uh, Donnie Moore gave up a home run to D D D Henderson and he committed suicide. Yeah. And Ralph Franco was able to handle it, I think, as well as he could. And in fact, he and Bobby Thompson went around the country. Uh, they made almost a living out of it. So it shows you how that particular moment affected him. And again, um, I have to defend Ralph because he's from Mount Vernon, <laughs> Mount Vernon boy. So I have to do that a little bit. But um, it was also, I, it was funny, during the exhibit a few times, um, I had one guy from Mount Vernon come in and he looked at the, my Ralph Branker thing. And he said, I hated the Brankers. I said, why? You're from Mount Vernon? Why? He said, well, the pitching set from Alvin High was Branca, 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 and Branca. I could never get on it. He had three or four brothers who were fantastic athletes, too. Uh, and John Branca, who lived around the block from me growing up in Mount Vernon, he actually be became the boxing commissioner for New York State for a while. So, um, but it, it, in the same token, I, I got to talk to him a few times, and he knew exactly where I lived. And I never actually got to meet him. I was on, I got up to a few phone calls, but it, it was just, uh, uh, but, you know, in, in historically thinking, uh, many people consider it the number one or number two most important home run. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Neil, uh, you know, you're in the group now, per se. Just know that anytime you have any kind of baseball exhibit or something, you, you just yeah. send it to me and, I, you know, I will send it out to everybody. No, I, I think when you first uh, did this, I, I believe Mo Reznor was there. Um, yeah. You know, he was there. Um, just one other thing. So you talked about the, uh, the catch and, uh, the Thompson home run. Would you baseball wise, polo ground wise, would you consider the Hubble striking out the five guys, the next greatest baseball moment in, uh, polo grounds history? I think I would, I oh, it would be, it would be right in there. I'd have to give a little more thought. There was so much going on there, but I think you'd have to, um, You'd have to give that. Also, um, you know, just uh, Hubble's career is fantastic. I think John McGraw is another person I thought was incredible to learn about. I would have liked to have done more about him. Um, also, you know, Babe Ruth loved the polo grounds. Um, he, his first home run was as a Red Sox was at the polo grounds, um, I think in 1915 or something like that. Um, and actually, when the Yankees left the polo grounds to go to Yankee Stadium, Ruth's first impression was, I'm never going to get a home run here. He was he was a little upset about that. Of course, he he made the, that the house that Ruth built, but he would have liked to stay at the Polo Grounds. But McGraw couldn't wait to get him out of there. <laughs> I'm sure Steve thinks that Dusty Rhodes' uh, pinch homers were right up there as well. I do too. <laughs> uh, Mars, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Neil, for joining us. Uh, along with Ruth Garrick, Fox Simmons, the name that uh, you probably picked over. Uh, but, but I'm sure you know it, it's Joe Cronin. Yeah. You know, the other thing is I was at the uh, that second fight at the Polo Grounds, Johansson, Patterson. My my pop took me there. We were sitting all the way up in the upper deck, so the fighters looked like ants. <laughs> but we went there. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, as far as the spy camera goes, they had such an incredible um, stretch of road wins that, that year where they didn't have the camera. So uh, you know, that okay. speaks for them. And my question of the day is, uh, where exactly is the Morris Jumel Museum location? What is the cross street? And it, um, I wish I had that in front of me, but it's, I would think that would have been one like 58th and um, I think it's called Jamel Plaza or something. I, I don't know the exact name, but it's it's uh, it's very it's an incredible place. When I first saw it, it it's this big house on top of a hill, and and um, and learning about it, as I said, it was George Washington's headquarters during the Revolutionary War, and he probably saw when New York was burning from up there. Uh, I don't know, but it's um, but to think that that was probably the, maybe the only house up there in the night in 1761 when it was built. You know, surprised me. And again, um, I like to think I know history, but I was a little bit surprised. I had no knowledge of it. And uh, of course, I was working with probably the uh, museum that had very little means. So I had to do what I could basically by myself to get all that stuff up there and do things. But 
it was a great learning experience. I, I the show was extended a few times, but um, uh, I hope in the future, I'm working on hopefully getting a more substantial museum to work with me where I could really, I think, do some special things. I've reached out to the New York Historical Society, even the Transit Museum. Um, I've done, um, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, I was just recently at a the Union League Club, which is a private club in New York, invited me to spend um, uh, last month there. And in the future, you guys are all welcome to come to see it at private clubs. I just have to, you know, make me, you my special guest, which I'm more than happy to do. Thank you, Neil. Mars, it's uh, it's on 162nd Street. Oh, thank you, Gary. Um, let me see if I see a cross street here. Um, I think it's Broadway. Yeah, Amsterdam and 162nd. Well, Amsterdam, right, right, right. It's That's not too far from um, like Columbia Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in that area. Uh, six, seven blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Any other, any other questions, comments, Bill? Bill, you okay? <laughs> well, I guess I'd ask you, if, was there any subject that, I mean, there were a lot of things I could have done that I couldn't get to, but was there anything that you thought that uh, was missing that was something I should have had, uh, put in in some, some respect? I want to give you one fact. Hello? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Uh, I went to a soccer game at the Polo Grounds during the interim Giants met years, 57, yeah. you know. Oh, no, 58, 59, something like that. <coughs> Sorry. And, of course, they had stock car racing, too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. I, You know, the one thing I would also say is that, uh, although I would love to have seen a baseball game there because it was so unique, I have a sense that it was really a great uh, stadium for football, the way it was shaped. I'd almost think it was – and uh, and I would think that, um, you know, to hear the Army and Navy, You freeze it out. It'll be significant and have all these major full powers kind of. Absolutely. Well, that was Polo Grounds was, was a football stadium masquerading as a baseball stadium. Yes, that's how I would look at it. I, and also I, boxing matches must have been special there too. Indy, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that one of your favorite artists was George Bellows. Yes. And his boxing, One, he's one of my favorite artists too. Yeah. I'm right now in Woodstock and he has a house right his he lived in Woodstock and I went to his house and wow. uh, that's all I wanted to say I I love uh, George Bellows also no, no. well you know he's interesting um you know he was a baseball player he went to Ohio State little rival me I'm a Badger and um his coach apparently realized that he was I think he was a pitcher too uh, realized that his uh, artistic talent was better than his pitching, and, and said when he when he went to the coach and said, "Should I stay or should I go to go to my art school in New York?" He said, "You know, we love you as a pitcher, but I think you can do a lot better as an artist." And he, it was true. But it's nice that he incorporated sports in his paintings. Yeah, you know, Neil uh, Paul, uh, one of our really good members, mentioned that you might want to contact the Yogi Berra Museum. It's and a great. I, I know years back, you said the New York Historical Society, they had a wonderful thing about baseball in the, in the, in the 50s with the Yankees, the Dodgers, and the oh, yeah. Giants. It was fabulous. And they gave up a huge room for that. So, No, that's a great idea. I did, I, Eve Shannon, I believe her name is, uh, the president or director of the museum, actually came to the Marston Mail to see my show. And she was very nice. She liked it a lot. She, did, she told me she was going to keep my pieces in mind because I, uh, you know, maybe I have to do something a little bit more with, with Yogi Berra or something like that. When okay. I asked Yogi Berra where, where, his, where is the museum, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Gary and um, Neil, I'm still in touch with Lindsay Berra and they just oh, produced the documentary, which yes. is down at the Tribeca Theater and I know Marty Appel was there. I, Gary, I can forward Lindsay Berra's email address to you and you can send it to Neil. She might be the one to contact. That would be great. It would be nice to work with uh, museums like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, 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 when, you know, this whole thing really happened. Um, uh, I was actually doing a project in Waterbury, Connecticut, uh, an art project. And I happened to speak to the director and I said, is this Yankee territory or, Met, or, or Red Sox territory? And she said, we're kind of the dividing line between the two teams. 
And I immediately said, you guys should do a show about that. And two weeks later, she called me up, we're going to do a show, but you're the curator. And I'd never done that before. But I took it as a challenge. And I, I think I did OK with, the, with my shows. Uh, Remember the McRae brothers from Mount Vernon? As a matter of fact, I grew up at Scooter Rodney. I played with them. I had some great moments with them. And um, I actually uh, wasn't a bad ball player, but, you know, Mount Vernon, everybody basically gets a scholarship. And um, uh, the coach made me the scorekeeper for the undefeated Knights of 77. And I still remember Hank Raymond's and uh, Jim Beheim and uh, 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 Denny Crum recruiting Scooter Rodney. And at one time, um, uh, Hank Raymond's came to me and said, Neil, would you like to go to Marquette? Well, first of all, I was going to University of Wisconsin, but if he thought I had any influence in Scooter, <laughs> I think he was mistaken, but it was kind of fun to be around those guys. And my father went to Boys High in Brooklyn, which also has a great lineage uh, of Bill great Clark, basketball players. Uh, can I return a call? Sorry, Neil. <laughs> That's okay. Mr. Matt, Greg Prince. Thanks, Gary. Neil, I just wanted to say I did visit the exhibit when it was there. It was terrific. Thank you very much for putting it together. I had always sort of wanted to go to that structure. Uh, something in the video that Gary showed brought it all back for me. Just that little glimpse out the window where there used to be a ballpark. Remember when I saw it in November of 2019, it gave me chills then, it gave me chills now. And I've spent the last two and a half years looking at every picture that's taken that shows above third base. Like, hey, there's the Morris Jamel Mansion. It was, it was always there. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, at any point in your research, did you find whether there was a relationship between the mansion once it became a museum and the Giants or anything with the Polo Grounds or were they just neighbors? You know, it's a great question. I think that scholarship there is really lacking. And I, I try to reach Columbia or NYU at Fordham if they could do something there because obviously it had some interest. Uh, even I think Stoneham of the Giants at one time was a benefactor there. So mm -hmm. I was trying to find out, did Willie Mays come here? Did they ever have like a dinner here? Anything like that. There wasn't anybody to show that. That's why I, I in my heart, believe Christy Matthewson must have gone there, being that he was such a uh, historian in his own way and a very mm -hmm. articulate guy. Uh, I will also say something that's pretty interesting is uh, apparently people would be um, uh, sit on the slopes over uh, the museum during ball games. You could mm -hmm. see like you couldn't see everything, but you could probably see most. You could probably could have seen Mickey. Um, you probably would have seen Willie Mays make that basket catch, and apparently you you would hear the roars from polo grounds up there. You would hear, and I'm always thinking when Willie Mays made that catch, when Bobby Thompson hit his home run, or when um, uh, Dempsey knocked out Furpo, I'm sure that the whole area of Manhattan was electric with, with, with screaming voices and clapping. So it must have been very exciting to be there. Yeah, I've seen pictures from the Giant Cup makeup game or playoff game from 1908 in the lawn. It's filled with uh, people trying to uh, get a glimpse because, you know, you couldn't get into the ballpark. Yeah, I know. So it was, uh, you know, it's it's something that it's unfortunate that we've, we, one of the things I wanted, why I wanted to do the project too, was I've always felt that the, um, that the, the Dodgers and Ebbets Field get so much credit. And they do, I mean, they should, the, the boys of summer and all that. But I always thought the polo grounds sort of get, getting short attention. So I'm glad I was able to bring some of that to uh, New York and the people who came, I think found it very interesting. So I was happy that I got to do that. No, great job, thank you for doing it. You know, before, you. I, before I turn it over to Renee for a question. You know, Neil had invited me to this and things were just school and my daughter giving birth that year and I just didn't make it. And I was watching a movie called Delivery Man. It's a stupid movie with Vince Vaughn who father's like 500 kids with his sperm <laughs> and one of the kids turns out to be uh, a volunteer at the Morris Jamel ah. and he's going there and, and Vince Vaughn is talking to the kid not telling him he's the father but anybody's around him oh isn't this guy great you know what a great tour guide or whatever and after seeing that I was like hey man I gotta I gotta get in touch with Neil because <laughs> This would really work on the Zooms because prior to the, us doing Zooms, you know, if you missed the exhibit, you know, you kind of missed it. This kind of brought everything back. So 
uh, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, I got back in touch with Neil. Renee, you're up. Yeah, thanks. Um, Neil, great. It was awesome to, to, to see. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I got a question, because um, uh, it was edited down to, uh, uh, for, for those 30 minutes. You do have some stuff on the Negro Leagues, the New York Cubans at the Polo Grounds, yes? I, I had one photograph, but I didn't have enough. I, I really feel, uh, I, I wish I had more to do, time to do that night. I did try to make an effort with African-Americans, but the Cubans definitely deserve to have more attention to them. So I'm hoping to do that. But I've been working on a couple of um, uh, pieces now of, of Latin players, you know, Roberto Clemente I'm working on. And uh, uh, it's always fun to, to have that. And besides the projects that I'm working on, people commission me. Some of my clients commission me to do things. And I did something, uh, uh, Walter Pate recently and things like that. So um, I think the... Um, uh, it, that's a that's a, a great subject to get involved in. So I'm definitely going to look into that. Neil, Thank I got to tell you something that if you go through with this, what you need to do. Uh, when the Giants were playing the Pirates, some guy out in left field had this banner. And I, when I first saw the banner, I was like, what the hell are you talking about? It said, retire 21. And I was like, what are you talking about? The Pirates yeah. retired it. Uh, there is a, you know, they're trying to get 21 retired, like Jack. Oh, 42. Okay. So, uh, may, may, if that ever comes to fruition that you're doing this, yeah. you should try to get one of those banners because I think that is. No, that sounds, that sounds good. Uh, no, it's, that's a great, uh, my only, uh, you can see my only problem is uh, it takes so long to put these together. Uh, the way I want to do them anyway. Uh, and also one thing that I've been, and I'm working one, piece it's a little bit far-fetched a little bit off subject but i'll just let you know one of the things that's grown tremendous value over the last eight or ten years of vintage tickets as you know when you go to a um a play a ball game now you don't even get a ticket you don't even get a cheap stuff up you, i guess it's on the phone and um uh i was way ahead of the time because I, I always thought vintage tickets had more meaning and but now uh the valuations are just crazy and uh one of the pieces that i'm working on to, to be, you know, removed a little bit from the polo grounds is what I call the greatest single scoring um, accomplishment in a single game. And that's Will Chamberlain's 100 point game. And about in 2012, shows you how long I've been working on this piece. I was able to acquire the ticket from that game, which was played in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And only about 4,000 people there and only 13 tickets known. And I bought it for a lot of money for me. It was like $12,000, a lot of money. Uh, but to show you how things have expanded in the sports collectibles and the art world, even in, in this crazy uh, time, it's market that we live in. Um, that ticket's come up twice this year and brought 127,000 and, and 107,000. So um, I'm not sure mine's in that valuation, but it's certainly worth the 12,000 I bought. And, but what I've done to uh, supplement that is I got in the program. Now I got the autograph of all the players who played on, in that game for both teams. I got a piece of the floor from Hershey Park. I got the um, an original pennant from Hershey Park. So it's going to be, but that's what I do. And I think it makes it more unique than just having a single item. That's great. Uh, we're going to go uh, Steve, Mars, Renee. Steve, go ahead. Uh, Neil, I just had breakfast with uh, one of the Nick players who was in that game. He's a good friend of mine. If you want to connect with him, we can make it work. Sam Stiff. Good. Sam Stiff from St. Bonaventure. Okay. I know he was on the roster, but did he actually play in that game? He sat on the bench and he kept screaming, yeah. foul Guy Rogers. Foul the guy who's giving the ball to the Big Dipper. Wow. But there's a book out and there's now going to be a documentary done on the St. Bonaventure team. But if you want to talk to Sam. Okay, again, that, that would be great. I would, I'm going to forward the phone number to Gary. I just forwarded it. Lindsay Berezim, I'm going to forward uh, Sam's number. He would be glad to talk to you. That would be fantastic because I did get a letter from a guy who played on the Philadelphia Warriors who sadly passed after I got the letter named Joe R Ruckler, who from okay. played at Western, and he wrote about it and he told me what happened with the basketball and all this other stuff because there's so many stories about that. Neil, well, the main story is you don't want to get the big guy mad. I'm Gary, I'm going to send you the phone number. Neil, just tilt, tilt your screen. We're, all, we're not seeing your head. Oh, sorry. There you go. Mar uh, Mars, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, football was probably the most ideal sport in the polo grounds because it was oval. And I went to 
the New York Giants in their uh, last couple of years before they moved across the river to Yankee Stadium. So I saw the baseball, football Giants, the Titans, the Jets, and of course the Mets, boxing matches and all that. But my question is, it's uh, your feeling actually about that since the Giants already um, had the land, well, the city owned the land, I guess, and but they owned the ballpark, why didn't, what's your, what's your theory on why, and I've heard many different things about this that Horace wanted to move anyway, but why not, since you already have the land, remodel the polo grounds into a baseball looking ballpark with longer foul lines and, you know, uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, you know, reading about that, I think it was, first of all, that the Dodgers were taking the lead on all that and they needed another team. But I think the idea was those areas were, were beginning to become downtrodden a little bit and, and th nobody was putting enough effort into like um, uh, bringing the, the stadiums up to a, to, to a level that they should be. Even the Mets, I think the last year painted the whole thing for like 300,000 for the last two years. So I think it was partly that the um, environment wasn't conducive. And I think once the Dodgers were leaving and they wanted to stay for a period of time, and obviously they would, they they could only go if they could get somebody else. They made it, um, they made it beneficial for the Gi Giants to go. Of course, the Giants made a big blunder by building that's the state. They should have certainly built uh, uh, another polo grounds. Would have been much better than building the original Candlestick, which was really a terrible place to 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 watch a baseball game. Horace Stoneham never went out there in the afternoon. He yeah. he uh, relegated other people. To, to go there in the morning when the weather's very pleasant because the wind doesn't kick up till about 33 o'clock. So he didn't even have his hands, uh, you know, I I involved in the sight of Candlestick. And it seems to me there was so much more he could have done. He could have looked into New Jersey, like the Giants and Jets moved there. He could have looked into them, done so many things to keep a team in the largest market. I, I look... Uh I just can only imagine growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, knowing you had the Giants, the, uh, yeah. the Yankees, and the Dodgers, how wonderful that must have been. All the And, and I think in the 50s, I think just about every World Series had at least one New York team and not the whole. So yes. it was an excellent time. Uh, my father grows up in Brooklyn, as I said, but he was a Yankee fan, which always surprised me. But uh, I guess he wasn't a good loser, so he became a Yankee fan. I don't know. <laughs> Renee. Yeah. Renee? You know, uh, you brought up uh, uh, a few minutes ago uh, about tickets. Yes. Um, for, for me, is the same thing, too. And, you know, your exhibit brought that personal aspect yes. uh, of your stories. Not only that, but uh, that's also important. And I still have a bunch of tickets, whether it's Mets, Yankees, uh, uh, Knicks, Hockey Ranger, you know, whatever. Uh, ABA Nets, you know. Um, uh, but your, your scorecards... Yes. That's a big deal. I yeah. think I, I think you got it with the tickets, scorecard, and yes. believe it or not, yearbooks. I mean, yeah. it's such a timely that yeah. year thing. You know, what I'm yeah. saying? that moment, that week, that month thing that brings you know the whole storytelling uh, yeah. a, a, a lot more personal. Yeah, I think you're reaching a point that I do because the ticket, and I, and I like to get the program scored. Uh, with the mustard stains, the ketchup stains. I don't want it to score six months or six years later in perfect penmanship. Um, I find it, I want to bring, the whole idea is to bring you into the game and relive it as best you can without being there. So it's very important. One thing I'll, I'll bring up that um, was um, talking about the polo grounds and talking about the Giants was um, one piece that I did uh, on, on Don Larson's perfect game um, was the, the besides uh talking about what Larson and the, and the mantle and all that stuff was, there was an advertisement on the scoreboard that said New York Giants playing the Pittsburgh Pirates this Sunday. And why that was so interesting, that would be the first game the New York Giants football team would be playing outside the polo grounds. It probably was the first advertisement of the Giants football. So it was very tangential to the polo ground story, but I thought it was interesting because I, the Giants to leave to go to the Yankees, uh, to the polo grounds, I got to believe that the polo grounds was uh, – as the gentleman before had said, a bit it had been, been redone. I got to believe the Giants might have stayed at the Polo Grounds because it was such a, you know, a perfect football stadium. And let O'Malley go by himself. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think that could have happened, but you know, uh, at least at that point of, of baseball, but, uh, you know, I don't well, think the Dodgers in, in retrospect are unhappy that they left because they've had success in LA. Well, Neil, did you know that Robert Moses, you have to read the power broker by Robert Carroll, that uh, Moses offered O'Malley flushing meadow and O'Malley said, who would want to come to these swamps? So you imagine if Horace Stoneham took Moses offer for flushing meadow and let the Dodgers go west, they would have had the market, the national league market all by themselves with a new stadium. You know, you bring up a good point. And by the way, in the last exhibit I did, uh, at the Union League Club, it's on video too. If you want to go look at it, I just put it on video. It's it's I think it's called Neil Shearer Sports Conversation Art on YouTube, and I do a whole thing on the '55 Brooklyn Dodgers. And what it's actually a triptych because there was so much to do. And one of the interesting aspects what, that I put in was a um, a stadium idea that the, that O'Malley wanted, which is very cool. It, it almost uh, it was almost the first one that be um, uh, with a roof. And I thought it was pretty cool. It, looked, it almost looks like it would be perfect for today, even though it was designed in 1955. So I thought that was, uh, that's an interesting thing that you brought up. Does anybody else who has not spoken want to ask a question before we wrap it up? All right, Neil, cannot thank you enough, man. I thought this was wonderful. Thank Neil you so much. Up, Neil gave up his vacation to do this tonight. So. <laughs> By last night up in Vermont. So <laughs> let me go enjoy it. But thank you guys again. I look forward to seeing you in the future, and I look forward to seeing you in person at one of my next exhibits. And Neil, make it up. Neil, thank you so much. Neil, join us for one, and you know, if any of these interests you, hop on board, okay? Well, you know, I feel kind of lucky because I know I think Marty Appel did the previous show. Yes. And Marty's been to two or three of my exhibits, and when he says Neil, nobody does what you do, I think I, it was a compliment because he's he's probably the greatest New York Yankees historian right now, as far as I'm concerned. So. Anyway, thanks again, everybody. Thank Have a great day.